If you have your Bibles with you this evening, open up to the Gospel of Mark. Oh, y'all yeah, thought I was going to say Matthew. <laughs> I was already. <laughs> Mark chapter 15. And we're going to just read through. I've made just a very few notes here. We're going to just read through the Good Friday, the events that Mark records on Good Friday. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation, and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So this would be around 5 or 6 in the morning. This is the formal or legal trial that they would have to make official what they did at the illegal trial the night before, they being the Sanhedrin. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is as you say. The chief priests began to accuse him harshly. <laughs> then Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you? Pilate was not accustomed to someone standing before him and remaining silent. But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Nobody had done this. Now at the feast he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. This of course would be Passover. Verse 7, the man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists and had committed murder in the insurrection. This man Barabbas was the original person whom was bound for the cross, the very cross that our Lord will end up on. A true criminal. And yet, we're going to see in verse 8, the crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. It is this man they will choose to have Pilate release. Pilate answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And Pilate in the back of his mind is saying, Please pick this man. He's not guilty. For he was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. It wasn't that he was a true criminal as far as Rome was concerned. It was these Jewish leaders were envious of him. It was political. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? They didn't really call Jesus that. They accused him of saying that. But Pilate is taking a little jab at him. He's very annoyed with him. They shouted back, crucify him. But Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. They've made their mind up. They made their mind up the night before. <laughs> this is all just the formality. Make it happen. And then in verse 15, Pilate, being the politician he is, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Scourged. That is to be whipped with a whip called a flagellum. And it would have metal or bone tips on the ends. It would have multiple strands. And it had one simple purpose. Evil, devious purpose. And they would whip it. It would grab onto flesh and it would rip it as they brought it back. See, when we read it and we just read and Je having Jesus scourged, if we don't know what that word means, we don't get the full picture. 
But they would whip him with these whips and it would rip the flesh off of his bone, tearing muscle. And this is just the beginning. Verse 16. The soldiers took him away into the palace, that is the praetorium. This is where Pilate would be staying at while he's there in Jerusalem. And they called together the whole Roman cohort. A cohort would be 600 men. This man who's not a criminal by Pilate's own admission. He's been scourged. They take him to the praetorium. And Pilate calls in 600 soldiers. You think Pilate has in, his, in the back of his mind a thought there's something about this man? He remains silent when nobody else would have. He seems very concerned, if not even afraid, of what's going to happen. He desperately wanted them to pick Jesus for him to release, but they didn't. And then we see in verse 17 here, They dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews. This is mockery. This Purple would be a soldier's cloak that they draped around him, mocking a king's robe. Of course, what's a king without a crown? So they come up with the most cruel crown they could think of. Thorns twisted together, placed violently down on his head, cutting into his forehead. Blood, no doubt, by this point, dripping down all in his face. We can't even imagine what his back must look like. Because when they would use this scourging on him, they would tie him to a post. And they would just whip him and tear flesh as they go. So you get an idea of already what Jesus has went through here. And then they mock him. As if the beating, the physical part wasn't enough, they mock him. Hail, King of the Jews! Verse 19, they kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. They continued to mock. They disrespect him by spitting on him. Can you think of a more disrespectful act? They've already, they've already had all this beating done, this whipping, and then they spit on him. And then, of course, we know they pull his beard from the other Gospels and prophecy. And after they've had their time with him, after they've mocked him, verse 20, they took the purple robe off him and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Oh, they have, they've had them a big time with him. To, hint, to them, he's nothing more than just another Jew. No doubt he had to be guilty according to them. He wouldn't be there if he wasn't. He's not a Roman, so he's automatically in their opinions beneath them. If they only knew who he actually was. Then in verse 21, we get an idea here. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Serene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. By this point, from the scourging, from the beating, all that he's endured, Jesus is unable to carry the cross beam, the horizontal part of the cross. They would make those who were to be crucified carry this upon their back to the place where they would crucify them. Jesus is unable to do it. Physically, he just cannot. His body is already too weak. So they forced Simon of Serene to do this. Now Mark mentions that he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. They'll come up later as part of the church. So he's tying back here, Mark is, as he writes this, 
This is the same Simon who's the father of Alexander and Rufus who those reading Mark's Gospel account would be more familiar with. So he's just tying that them together here. And then in verse 22, Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. In Latin it's Calvary. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. This would be a concoction that they would give to dull the pain. And before you think, oh, how compassionate of them, no. It was not done out of compassion. They would give this concoction to those to be crucified so that they would struggle less. They're not going to fight. It just numbs the body. They're not going to put up a fight. They're going to lay there and they're going to allow them to nail them to the cross. That's what they wanted Jesus to do. Drink this, go numb, and just let us do what we're going to do. But he would not drink it. He could not be numb. He still had his work to do, even on the cross. Verse 24, And they crucified Him. We don't get details of this in any of the Gospels. They say they crucified Him. Those in Jesus' day and in the early part of the church, they did not need details. They were very familiar with what this meant. For us, we are not accustomed, we're not around crucifixion. We have to, if we want details, we have to look it up. We have to research it. But they would be very familiar. They did not need any other explanation. They would nail him, stretch his arms out. Oftentimes they would tie them to the crossbeam and then nail him to it. Some say through the hand, some say through the wrist. And they would raise up the vertical part of the cross with him on it and they would nail his feet to it. And they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. As Brother Daniel said just a little bit ago, in all the pictures we see of it depicted, Jesus on the cross, he has that wrapping around his lower garments that's when he's on the cross, he doesn't have that. No one would. It's part of the shame and humiliation that goes with the cross. That was part of what Rome did with it. As they made an example of those they crucified. And of course here in verse 24, they divide up his garments. This fulfills Psalm chapter 22 verse 18. Now think about it. Long, long before this, even back... King David's day, and when the Psalms were written, God said this would happen. God knew this would happen. And then in verse 25, it was the third hour when they crucified Him. This would be about 9 o'clock in the morning. He's only going to be on the cross for six hours. Many others that would be crucified, we know from history, would be on there for days. Jesus will be on there. He will accomplish all that He needs to accomplish on the cross in six hours. Verse 26, The inscription of the charge against Him read, The King of the Jews. Rome would make a placard and hang above them that would have their charges of why they're being crucified. And then we know, if we look at all four Gospels, the full inscription read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And it would be in Latin, Aramaic, and Hebrew. So that all peoples around would know, would be able to read this. This is the crime that Rome is charging him with that explains the crucifixion. It's not a crucifying crime. It's not a crime they would normally crucify somebody for. And again, I said earlier, this cross was meant for Barabbas. When they made this cross, they had Barabbas in mind. They never, Pilate never thought 
they would choose Barabbas to be set free. But God knew who this cross was meant for. His son. As he dies in our place. Verse 27, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Mark doesn't go into it, but we know from Luke, especially, that one of these two will get saved and the other will not. That is how we know you do not have to be baptized to be saved. All that's required is that you believe Jesus is the Son of God who is for this particular person and he's paying for his sin at this exact moment beside him. And for all of us afterwards who paid for our sin. He died that substitutionary death. These no doubt would have been accomplices of Barabbas involved in the insurrection. These men, they did crimes. They were guilty. They were rightfully being crucified by the government. Jesus was not. Verse 28, And the scripture was fulfilled which says that he was numbered with transgressors. He's got one on each side. That scripture, of course, is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Verse 29, Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Verbal abuse, mocking him again. If he really had power, that's what they're saying. If you really had power, you'd get off that cross. If you really were the king, you'd come right off. If you were the Messiah, you would be off of the cross. If you had the power to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, certainly that cross couldn't hold you. They have no idea what they're talking about. Number one, they have falsely accused him of talking about destroying the temple. They thought he meant the actual literal temple. He never meant that. He meant his body. His body will be destroyed and rebuilt in three days because in three days, what we're going to celebrate this Sunday, he's going to get up from being dead. Again, they have no idea who they're talking to or what they're talking about. They wag their heads. You know what, what that looks like. You've seen people do that. Shaking that finger, moving that head. Verse 32. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. What did Jesus say before this? Even if they did see, they still wouldn't believe. People today, oh, if God would only show me a miracle, I'd believe. If you can't believe without a miracle, you won't believe with a miracle. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, not by seeing miracles. Miracles are great. We thank God for the miracles He gives us. But faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Miracles can lead to false faith. The Word of God can lead and only leads to truth. But you see here in verse 32, they continue to mock Him. If you were who you say you are, you would come off of that cross. You'd prove it to us. He's already done so much to prove that He is who He says He is. Verse 33, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. That would be noon to 3 p.m. So from 9 a.m. to noon, he's been hanging there. At noon, darkness fell over the whole land, over the whole earth. Make no mistake about it, this is not a natural phenomenon. This is supernatural Darkness has engulfed the earth because the creator of all is hanging on that cross and is getting ready to lay down his life. For three hours, darkness has engulfed the earth. 
And this is a darkness no one has ever seen. They've seen nothing like this. Verse 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And then Mark tells us, that's the Aramaic form. Mark tells us it stands for, translates, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew, in chapter 27, verse 46, gives us the Hebrew form, very similar. This verse we need to spend just a little, few more minutes on. In verse 34, something is happening that has never happened before in all of eternity and never will happen again. This is the moment that Jesus, God the Son, is going to experience, He's starting to experience separation from God the Father. That is why he says, why have you forsaken me? For the first time ever, he's cut off from the Father. The reason for this is very simple. God can have no part of sin. And yet Jesus took on all of our sin. He who knew no sin became sin. Brother Daniel said near the beginning of service, because holy God demands that sin be paid for. He cannot set it aside. It goes against His very nature of who He is. There is no other way for sin to be paid for for eternity than for God Himself to die and to bear this penalty for us. And that is exactly what's happening here. Jesus is cut off from fellowship with the Father. Maybe two minutes, three minutes. Not very long. Doesn't take Him very long. But in those, ever how many minutes it is, He pays our sin debt in full. He experiences this brief separation so that all who believe in Him as Lord and Savior will never have to experience separation. We are born with a sin nature. We have that separation from the time we're conceived. But when we trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we no longer have that separation. That is what Jesus is doing here. He is removing that. Then, of course, those who do not know Him are separated and will be eternally separated from Him in the lake of fire if they never come to know Him as Lord and Savior. I hope you get the full grasp of what verse 34 is saying to us. Verse 35. When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Part of this would be he's been hanging on the cross since 9 a.m. No doubt his mouth is dry. They don't understand what he said in verse 34, but they're also, it's part of their continued mocking of him. They're saying, Oh, he's calling for Elijah, who is the they thought he was the forerunner to the Messiah. So, oh, he's calling for Elijah because he needs Elijah to come save him. He can't do it himself. <laughs> Elijah's going to come down. Probably they thought in that chariot of fire that he went up to heaven in and was going to pull him down off the cross. You see, they're mocking him. He's not really the Messiah. That's what they're saying. Verse 36, someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Give him something to wet his mouth and let's see how this plays out. They want to see if Elijah's really going to come. They want to see a show. Sounds familiar. 
people today still they just want to see a show. Then in verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Another one of the verses that if you just read through, you may not fully understand the importance of it. In this verse, Jesus is doing something that would be physically impossible for anyone other than God. And what I mean by that is, He should not be able to utter a loud cry. By this point, He's been hanging there, nailed, His feet nailed, supporting His own body weight on just His arms and His hands. His lungs are having difficulty breathing. The diaphragm is not working as it's designed to work. He shouldn't be able to cry out. But He does. Because He's God. And of course, Mark doesn't record it, but Luke does in 23 verse 46. What He cries out here, Father, into Your hands I commit My Spirit. And then just before this, John records for us in chapter 19, verse 28, he says those three words. It is finished. Or in other words, he's saying it is paid in full. He acknowledges that he has paid the price on our behalf. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's saying, Daddy, I'm coming home. Then he breathes his last. Verse 38. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This, of course, you know, is the massive curtain in the temple that would separate the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. It provided that boundary to keep the Holy of Holies separate. And in doing this, because Jesus has paid our sin debt at this moment, God tears the boundary in two. God removes the boundary because Jesus removes the boundaries between God and man. Through Christ's death, God tears it. It is no longer needed. Verse 39. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. This man, this centurion, this Roman, comes to saving faith. Right here. Everything he has witnessed, everything Jesus has done on the cross, even down to the way he breathed his last breath, this man come to faith. There's no doubt in his mind. He must be the Son of God. He has seen... There's, we don't know how many crucifixions he's seen, but he's seen more than a few being a centurion. He has never seen one like what he's just seen. Then in verse 40, there was also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and Joses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, the Sabbath would start on sundown on Friday evening and last until sundown on Saturday evening. So this is before sundown on Friday. Verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. That's Mark's way of saying he's a believer. He's a, what we call Christians today. And he gathered up courage because Pilate's not very happy with the Sanhedrin. They forced his hand to have Jesus crucified who he said was innocent. So he gathered up courage, and he went in before Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Now, typically, it would be a family member that would go ask for the body. 
that if no one went to claim the body, they would take the body down off the cross, throw it over into a pile, and let nature take its course, as they say. But Joseph of Arimathea, not a family member by blood, gathered up courage and goes to Pilate and he asks for the body. Verse 44. Of course, being a member of the council, let me just say this, that means he's part of the Sanhedrin. He, he's one of those Pilate's not too happy with. So you see why he needed courage to go do this. Verse 44. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time. No. And summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. It's only been six hours. Again, this would typically take days for people to die on the cross. So Pilate's like, what's, is he trying to pull something? Is Joseph trying to get him off before he's actually dead? He confirms with the centurion. He's already dead in six hours. Verse 45. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph brought, excuse me, bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which, he had, which had been hewn out in the rock. Many say it was Joseph's personal tomb. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Josie's were looking on to see where he was laid. And that is Mark's account of what we call Good Friday. And what Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, done for us. 